Har du varit i England någon gång? För hvis du har det så har du uh, trott i hemlande till våres näste taler. Vi ska nämligen få höra från Adrian Plunkett och han har brukt sina egna erfarenheter som patient som inspiration till en bevägelse som har nått helt upp hit till våres del av världen. Han är er nämligen den som startade och etablerade uh, Learning from Experience i Storbritannien. Han är er överläge på ett av uh, en av Englands största barnintensivavdelningar i uh, vid barnsjukhuset i Birmingham. Så förresten är er Englands eller Storbritanniens näst störste by. Och vi hoppas att uh, alla där hemma är er passligt uh, god i engelsk or um, we hope that everybody their home is uh, good in English because <laughs> in a busy work environment we almost instinctively take the good things for granted and look for errors. And even though we shouldn't overlook uh, the bad things, learning from experience aims to highlight success stories and make them a bigger part of our daily routines. Adrian, the stage is yours. Hello, and thank you very much for having me at your conference. I'm Adrian Plunkett. I'm a pediatric intensivist in Birmingham in the UK. And yes, I'll be talking to you about learning from excellence. I'm very sorry I'm not there with you in person. I made a personal decision recently to reduce my carbon footprint, so I will not be attending any international conferences in the near future. But the good news is, with technology, I'm able to record this session for you, but I'm also going to be joining you live later in the conference. So I'll be talking about learning from excellence, about what this initiative is, where it came from, why I think it's important. And also I'll be showing you some of the evidence that we've gathered to show that this approach works and um, sharing with you some example reports and what we can learn from this approach. So I work in Birmingham in the UK in a old Victorian hospital called Birmingham Children's Hospital. My particular environment is intensive care, uh, which is, of course, a very safety-critical area. Uh, This is an image from our intensive care. And these are two of my colleagues, Donna and Hannah, smiling away. And this is here to remind me that this approach, the learning from excellence approach, is rooted in positive psychology. And what we do know is that there is a clear correlation between the staff experience, so how staff feel about their work and how they feel when they go about doing their work, and the outcomes for the patients. So it's worthwhile identifying initiatives that improve the experience for the staff because of the downstream effect for the patients. Learning from excellence is one of those initiatives. The background to the initiative came about as a result of some ideas that came into my mind whilst I was a patient about 10 years ago. I experienced some serious illness and spent some time in hospital. And during one of the times I was receiving health care, I suddenly noticed that things were going very well around me. There were some things that were not going well, but the majority of care I was receiving was successful. But I was also seeing and noticing excellence. And excellence for me was a balance of competence and compassion. Clearly there were some people and there were some teams and systems that were based on the fact that people were very good at doing what they were doing, they were competent, but also they were compassionate and able to make me feel like a human and that made me feel safe. And as I reflected on this during my recovery, I wrote a letter to the organisation who looked after me with positive feedback. This was a letter with intelligence about what went well And the idea was that this would be delivered to the individuals and the teams who I mentioned in the letter so they could receive the positive feedback and learn from it. And then some time passed, about two years passed, and I met one of the individuals who looked after me, who I mentioned in the letter. And it turned out he had not received the letter. It had never been passed to him. And this was a moment when I realised that there is an opportunity here to start to recognize what's working for the purposes of learning so we could provide feedback about things that work so individuals and teams can learn from that and that's what learning from excellence is about that is really our intention the aims of the initiative 
are to learn from what's working and also to provide positive feedback. And we think these two are linked in a virtuous cycle. Now, you may well have seen Holnagel's representation of event probability in terms of safety focus. So this normal distribution uh, highlights the fact that the safety one or the typical approach to safety, and this also applies to quality improvement, is to focus on the far left of this curve where things tend to go wrong. Whilst that's useful, it's only a small part of the system. There's an awful lot that's happening in the rest of the system that we could be learning from, but because of our current approach, we are not tapping that for insights. Uh, Bob Weirs, um, who was another academic in the world of safety, summarised this uh, nicely with this metaphor, trying to understand safety by only looking at incidents. So that far left of the curve is like trying to understand sharks by only looking at shark attacks. These are deadly and striking and important, but they only represent a very small part of the organism. The reason we tend to do this, of course, is because of our natural tendency to focus on things that are wrong, things that are anomalous or harmful. We have an inbuilt negativity bias. Um, here are a few slides that illustrate this negativity bias. Um, clearly, you can't help spotting the mistakes in this sentence because it's inbuilt, it's automatic, it's system one, automatic thinking. Um, in this slide, most people would say the most obvious thing is that one of the sums is wrong. And whilst that is true, it is ignoring the fact that four of the sums are correct. So that is four times more valuable as information. So we have a tendency to overvalue negativity. Um, my personal experience of this came uh, recently when I received some feedback uh, for a lecture I gave on a clinical topic and the lecture is rated from one to five, five being excellent and one being very poor. And I got the results back and almost all of the feedback was good and the average score was good and then I spent the rest of the day considering what it was that this individual had decided was very poor about my presentation. And in context, this is too much attention being paid to a shark attack, something very negative. And the correlation for patient safety here is the concept of risk migration. Risk migration is when you change a system in order to prevent something happening, and then that disrupts the system and migrates the risk. It moves the risk into the rest of the system. So if you respond to an extremely rare, serious event, there is a chance that you could destabilize the rest of the system that works very well most of the time. I usually at this point share the most read BBC news headlines just to illustrate the fact that we have this bias towards the negative and the majority of news headlines that we are attracted to. We, we select these headlines as the most read stories are negative and often they are sensationally negative. So I prefer this approach. Steven Pinker is a well-known academic in the world of psychology. And he points out that we make a lot of progress in humanity, but you would not be aware of that if you just read the news, because the news always focuses on negative information. So we're very sensitive and we're very attractive to negativity. And when you come back to the world of safety and quality improvement, but particularly in patient safety, the language that we use is necessarily very negative. It's words like risk, adverse event, serious incidents, harm. In the UK, we have a concept called never events, which are extremely negative shark attacks that we intend to learn from. But all of our endeavor to make things safer in this model is focused on things going wrong. And this, of course, has an effect on us as practitioners. If the system we work in has a unilateral approach to safety by only looking at things that are going wrong, then when we make mistakes, we will feel under scrutiny. It's quite right that we do scrutinize our mistakes, but if it is the only direction in which we look when we're trying to make things safer, then this will have an adverse effect on us. And this effect is described, it's sometimes called the second victim effect, the name may not be perfect, but the point is there is an adverse 
psychological effect of being scrutinised after making mistakes in healthcare. Now, of course, all this negativity bias is actually concerning our perception. It's possible for us to perceive things differently depending on our perspective, but also depending on the conditions and the environment. So this famous checkerboard illusion shows how we perceive things differently according to the conditions. In this case, the shadow leads us to believe that two checkerboard squares are different shades, but in reality, they are the same. Here's another example. A related effect is seen here. We can see two different shapes depending on the perspectives we choose to take. Both of these are available. And this is a key point. In this example, we can choose to see what we want to see from the two available options. In his book about consciousness, the neuroscientist Anil Seth talks about our mind's property of being able to turn up the gain, like turning up the volume, on aspects of our attention. So we can turn up the gain to notice an object we are looking for, or, for example, to pick out a face in the crowd, or equally we can turn down the gain for distractions that we don't wish to notice. So I like this metaphor. Coming back to the subject in hand, I believe we can choose to turn up the gain, at least temporarily, on what is working well to start noticing excellence everywhere, every day. So here's another quote I like that is related to this area. Tell me how you measure me and I will tell you how I will behave. So this makes us think about how we can measure anything really, but particularly safety and quality improvement and outcomes in healthcare. If we're focusing them all on harm metrics, then that is what we will present and that's what we will focus on. But we could also choose to focus on successful metrics. This is a complementary approach to focusing on harm. And then we'll measure something different. And this really prompts the question, what is safety anyway? Is it the absence of harm? That's what most people would say safety is. But can you really define something by the absence of something else? Is that, is that a complete definition? Now, I don't have a complete answer to this. Holnagel's framing of safety from safety one to safety two is a good start on this question. So coming back to learning from excellence, that is the background to, and some of the philosophy behind learning from excellence. But what we intended to do when we set up learning from excellence was to ask people to capture what is going well. The, the, the obvious question then is how do you capture something that is excellent when it isn't predefined because excellence is defined quite subjectively but if you ask people have you seen something excellent at work most people would say yes so with that in mind we just created a reporting system and asked people to report it when they see it so this is how it looks now in our organization we have a red box for reporting things that go wrong and or risks and a blue box for reporting excellence. And we keep them together because we believe that they come from the same mindset. They are two branches of the same tree. We also have a reporting page on the Learning from Excellence website, and there are many, many different reporting systems now around healthcare in the UK, but also overseas. And we just ask very simple questions. Who did something excellent and what did they do? So describe this. This is qualitative information, free text. And then an optional question, what can we learn from this? So if you see the excellence and you believe there's something already that you can learn from that, then you can share that through this reporting system. And in our organization, we have over 10,000 reports and we know that there are somewhere between 100 to 200 centers around the world using excellence reporting in, in some shape or form. We have started to look at what people report. <clears throat> no one has reported themselves yet. We're still waiting for the first report in which somebody says, I was excellent today, but it hasn't happened yet. They just tend to focus on what was done, what was done at the time. Just like that letter I wrote to the hospital, this is what these individuals did. Um, we've done a few efforts to put these reports into themes. I did an early thematic analysis a few years ago, and I realized that I was creating a list of human factors. These are, these are positive human factors. So these are different from the negative human factors that we wish 
to mitigate like cognitive errors uh, and misdiagnosis. These are positive human factors which tend to be quite pro-social, um, non-technical skills. So they're things like uh, attention to detail, compassion, consideration, diligence, empathy, trust, preparedness, prioritizing. Um, but we've now done a more in-depth analysis, and this is about to be submitted for publication, so this is not peer-reviewed currently. But with between two centres, so in Plymouth and in Birmingham, we've identified five large themes that characterise all of the reports. The first is pro-social behaviour, so that's generosity, compassion, kindness. And the second is expertise and technical skill, because often there is something technical that that goes very well and needs to be noticed. A positive work ethic is is often identified in reports, and sometimes that reflects an underlying system that is very stretched. Uh, Personalised patient care includes positive deviance and innovation, people breaking the rules in order to achieve successful outcome. And then teamwork and leadership go together at the end because you can't have a team without a leader and vice versa. Now, people often ask, how do you learn from this? You've called it learning from excellence. So what, what, where is the learning? And this is a great question. Um, to me, it is actually intuitive and obvious that you learn from positive feedback. And I think most people understand that and believe that to be true. Um, but it's worth just looking at this in a bit more detail. What do we really mean by learning? So the most simple definition of learning is a change in response to feedback. Now I'm going to show you some examples of how I think we learn from these reports. The first is to share with you an actual report that came in just a couple of weeks ago. And this is a nurse working in intensive care and she's describing what happened when one of her patients deteriorated very rapidly. So obviously being intensive care this is quite a uh, needed a timely response and this is a life-threatening deterioration. And what she described, I'm going to read it to you but it's also on the screen is as follows. The patient deteriorated. The situation was well controlled and kept calm. There were clear instructions from both the consultants. Everyone had a clear job. The team stayed for hours after the event to support me. Everyone who helped was amazing and hands-on. Everyone listened to one another. Um, and then she goes on to describe individuals and what they did um, that was good. And then at the end of the report, she there's a question, how can we develop excellence or what can we learn from this? And she has a couple of suggestions. And I just, the reason I'm sharing this is because many of these reports like this are full of uh, intelligence. Now, on the next slide, I've just highlighted the areas where you can just extract intelligence from the report. And in fact, I've put them all together on this slide. So what she described is a scenario that's well controlled, kept calm, everybody having a clear role, people being hands-on, everyone listening to one another, people are clear with their communication and they are consistent in their support and reassurance. This is for a nurse who was relatively nervous in this position. And then her recommendations for what we may learn from this is, can we have labels for our roles in these scenarios? And a small team is better than a big team for this type of incident. Now this can be analysed, this can be compared with other incident reports from the adverse incident report and from excellent incident reports in order to get intelligence about what it is that makes our systems work well. We can also use this for simulation training for future events. And one of the things that we like to do with this type of report is to, is to use a method of inquiry called appreciative inquiry. This is about asking questions that are positively framed about something that has gone well and then imagining and creating and generating ideas to make things better in the future. It's based on the idea that you get answers to the questions that you ask. So if you ask negatively framed questions, uh, such as what we do in root cause analysis to understand the root cause of a problem, then you'll get answers to those questions that are focused on what is going wrong and then necessarily negatively focused. So the opposite is true if you ask for positively framed future looking generative questions. Now we often hear this quote, we learn from failure, we don't learn from success. That's actually a quote from the book Dracula. Um, and I don't believe it's true. I think we 
do learn from failure. Certainly we do. There's good evidence to say we learn from failure. But we actually do learn from success. And in many situations, we learn from success and positive feedback better than we do from failure. So if you look into the psychological literature and the neuroscience literature, you find evidence to support that. Earl Miller, who's a well-known neuroscientist, has done some fascinating experiments showing that success and the positive feedback that comes with success has a greater influence on the brain, on the structure of the brain and the connections of the neurons and the networks than failure does. So success is more instructive than failure in terms of making longer lasting and more rapidly forming memories. And actually in the psychology literature, there's evidence that positive feedback is better than negative feedback in many domains of learning, including self-efficacy, which is um, one's awareness of one's own competence, uh, improving motor learning. I'll show you a slide in a second about an experiment that shows how we have better motor learning and retention of skills with positive feedback, but better memories, better intrinsic motivation, this internal intrinsic motivation. Uh, positive feedback improves well-being, both receiving and giving positive feedback makes us actually feel better. Uh, and it improves relationships. I know from when I write an excellence report for a colleague, my relationship with that individual is improved and changed. And we know that improved relationships are key to good performance of teams. And positive feedback can even be used as a moral reinforcer. This is a concept in which we use positive feedback to say, this is how we do things around here. This is our behavior. So success is instructive. And so this is my take home uh, point that learning from excellence uh, or whatever you call it, so positive feedback that is sincere and genuine highlights success in an environment where our prevailing approach is to highlight failure. So our typical approach to learning is to highlight failure. And yet this is a complementary novel approach. We've asked some of our colleagues at work, what do you think about this initiative? Here's a slide that shows um, the results of one of those questions by reporting excellence. Most people think they are improving patient care and they also believe that excellence reporting significantly boosts their motivation and that's consistent with what we've seen in the psychological literature as well. Now here's an interesting study to add evidence to this approach. Um, I mentioned it earlier uh, these authors from the domain of sports science did an experiment looking at the relative effects of positive feedback and negative feedback on learning a complex motor skill. So the motor skill here was throwing a ball with a blindfold on into a hoop with a non-dominant hand. So a difficult skill. And they gave, they randomized the volunteers into two groups. One group received feedback that was positive, so for the best outcome, and the other group received feedback that was negative for the worst outcomes. And they found that both groups improved. You can see on the graph, the uh, open circles are the positive feedback. And over time, they repeated the, the uh, experiment, giving the feedback, and over time, the accuracy improved. So firstly, that shows that positive and negative feedback can be used to improve performance and retention and learning new skills. But the retention is the key point here. When they came back the following day to repeat the experiment, the group who had received positive feedback had much better retention of the skill. So they both learned at the same rate, but the positive feedback group had better retention, better memory. This is another experiment that's recently published, and this is from healthcare. So this is a study about motivation and learning. And what the authors of this study did was they showed stories of outcomes in healthcare to healthcare workers. And some of these stories were perceived as where things went very badly wrong and others were stories where things went very well, so excellence reports. And then there were some stories in between. And what they found is that there's a relationship between motivation to learn and the outcome in the story. So we are motivated to learn when we read about a story where things go very badly wrong. And that is like what we call the cautionary tale. Something's gone wrong, I want to learn from this. But it turns out on the far right of the curve, we also learn, we also 
motivated to learn from when things go very well. So these are the excellence reports. And this adds weight to the idea of sharing reports with a wider group saying, look at this, look what's happened, this is inspiring. We find it inspiring to read about extreme success. There's another piece of evidence from our own institution. Um, after creating Learning from Excellence, we were asked many times, how do you know if this is working? Um, and after a while, I thought, well, why don't we try and test this in a quantitative quality improvement setting? So with a small grant from the Health Foundation, we did a project where we made improvements in antimicrobial stewardship, which is an area that I'm interested in, by using positive feedback. So we set out to reduce antimicrobial consumption on the intensive care unit. And the way we did it was to provide positive feedback when practitioners were following good practice in antimicrobial stewardship. So this is different from the typical approach of trying to mitigate or reduce things going wrong. We were amplifying things going well. And we had a positive impact on many of the behaviours. This one is an example of what happened when we in, when we gave positive feedback for prescribing practice. Um, the two red lines show the six-month time period where we gave the feedback. And you can see the overall standard improved. And indeed, it led to a significant reduction in antibiotic prescribing and antibiotic consumption. So we believe this is like a stake in the ground, a proof of concept for how quality improvement could be done in the future. Now, this is a study from IBM. You may have seen this before. It's called the Work Trends Survey. And what they found in this study of 16,000 participants from different industries was that the individuals who receive recognition for doing a good job, so positive feedback, are more likely to be engaged in their work. And this is important because engagement in work is related to performance, even related to financial performance, as shown in this study by Michael West. And what Michael West says as a conclusion of this paper is related to what I opened this presentation with. In general terms, the more positive the experience of staff within the hospital, the better the outcomes. Now, one of the things that I like to talk about as, as I wrap up this presentation is how do you implement this? So you may already have implemented this or something similar. Um, on our website, we put down a top 10 tips. So these are things which I think are important to consider when you're implementing this type of change. Um, <clears throat> just very quickly, I'll read them through now, but these are all available on the website. Um, so you have to make it easy. So we have an online reporting system, for example. We don't define excellence in advance. We recognize that it's subjective. We start small and let it grow from there. And we don't make it a top-down initiative launched from the top. We start it from the bottom and grow it up. If you're launching it, then you need to actually do it. So when we launched, I and the champion who worked with me just started writing the reports. We make sure the reports are fed back very quickly, automatically in most cases. We always say thank you to the people who have done the reports, so they also receive acknowledgement. Um, we make the feedback private, but not anonymous. This is an area of contention and maybe an area for future research. But if I give you an excellence report, you will receive it from me with my name on it, but I won't be putting your name on the notice board. I may share some of the information from the report, but it will be anonymous. We study the reports using appreciative inquiry and the thematic analysis. And we recommend sharing the learning, as I said, in that study where people are inspired by reading about things that go very well. We recommend sharing it. They are my top 10 tips for implementation. But there's one other thing that comes up quite commonly is how do you deal with people who object to this? How do you deal with people who don't see the value in the initiative? And you may have seen this before, it's called the diffusion of innovation curve, or the diffusion of innovation bell. And when you launch any initiative, you immediately recognize a small number of your colleagues who are innovators and early adopters, the first sort of 15%. And they, you surround yourself with those people and they help promote your initiative. And then everybody else gets carried away. You will, eventually, you will of course, meet laggards. And these are the cynics or the 
very sceptical individuals who don't um, see the value in the initiative. My approach has always been to listen and then ignore politely. So I let them speak, let them tell me what the concerns are, and provided there are no serious concerns, then I just ignore them. And then the initiative, if it is successful, they will get carried away with it. And there have been several examples of colleagues who have seen the light um, once they've engaged with excellence reporting. Now, one of the first things, of course, you should do before you do any of the implementation is seek approval from the leaders of your organisation. So in my organisation, the chief executive and the medical director were very supportive of innovation. Um, so I didn't have a problem. But we have encountered colleagues and organisations where there has been some obstruction. And often what's happening there is there is a different language being spoken. So this slide is taken from the Carnegie Report, um, and the author is Julia Unwin, and I highly recommend this report. It's about kindness in public policy. I'm just focusing on this diagram from the report, where there is a depiction of the fact that we often use different languages when we're talking to each other. And if we're speaking a different language, then often we just won't understand each other. So in the report, there's a comparison made between the rational lexicon or the rational language, and this is focused on value and targets and data and evidence, quantitative metrics. And then the relational lexicon or relational language, which is more focus, focused on connection and hope and well-being and friendship and warmth and storytelling. And I think sometimes with the learning from excellence message is relational and we're talking to leaders who think more rationally. And so we need to translate to each other in order to understand each other. And that's why we devised that quality improvement project. And that is why I am building up an evidence base to support this so we can both talk the same language. And in fact, a personal ambition of mine for the next few years is to seek a large grant to test this approach to quality improvement and to measure the impact and to understand the mechanisms of learning from excellence in, in a multi-centre trial. So if you wish to know more and join the community, uh, this is entirely free and open access. So you can go to learningfromexcellence.com and click to join the community. There are events and conferences. Um, we do talks, we publish papers, and we have a community where people talk to each other. So please do come and join if you're interested. That was our conference um, just before the pandemic. And then the last one we held last year was a virtual conference. And we always make these as positive as possible whilst also addressing the challenges that we face in healthcare. Um, if you're interested in Twitter and social media, that's the handle to follow us. Um, but I will end my presentation there. And thank you very much for listening. Um, I look forward to hearing some questions and to interacting with you later in the conference. Thank you so much, Adrian. And uh, I'm wondering, are you here with us uh, right now live? Hello. Hey, there you are. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Um, we, uh, we're waiting for uh, questions from you guys, and we have got, uh, gotten two in already. Uh, and uh, they, in their defense, they got in before the part with the uh, uh, positively angled uh, questioning uh, uh, w that you told us about, Adrian. And the first question is, uh, can you please talk a, bit, a little bit about barriers to implementing learning from excellence? Sure. Uh, the, occasionally we come across organizations where there is some obstruction or uh, blocking and it tends to come from leadership within an organization. Um, so what we've always advocated is getting on board with the leadership first and what I was trying to say towards the end of that presentation is to be mindful of the language that you use. So you may Typically, the obstruction to this is based on the fact that we need to fix all the harm first. We need to eliminate everything negative before we can start focusing on positive. 
Uh, of course, that's impossible because we will never eliminate every single piece of harm. There will always be um, things going wrong. There will always we could get better and we'll make progress, but there will always be something on the far left of that curve. So what I recommend is using data to speak to those people to say that this is a complementary approach. It doesn't do any harm. Uh, it can raise the average performance and it may actually reduce some of the uh, adverse events and some of the harm that's happening in your system. And then I and then I point towards the evidence. So some of the evidence I shared in that paper from the IBM survey, there's the Michael West study in the National Health Service in the UK, which shows that um, staff experience and engagement is related to financial performance and quality of performance of uh, hospitals and, and uh, healthcare organisations. So then you're speaking the same language. And then what you're looking for is permission to deliver this project on a small scale. So doing it as a pilot in a single department and letting it grow from there. That's some of my um, responses to barriers. Um, there's just one more thing. There's a paper we published actually a couple of years ago, which looked at some of the barriers and facilitators of learning from excellence. One of the barriers was having a very low morale, a, a sort of low well-being. Um, but one of the facilitators was also having a low uh, morale or low well-being in the team. So this is quite a complex issue and we're not quite sure what that means yet. So there is more research to be done to understand what facilitates this and what blocks it. But I would always start with getting the leadership on board. Yes, very good. And um, you, uh, you have uh, been gotten, getting some questions, so we, we'll actually skip some of the ones that you already have uh, answered pretty thoroughly already. But uh, what effects have you noticed on individuals that have gotten nominations? Um, this is a nice question. Um, so it's almost always very positive and sometimes I think probably the main characteristic which would describe the individual's experience is a positive surprise um, because often people think they're just doing their job but then they they get this feedback that says they were doing their job but it had a much more positive impact than they realized well I've met people who've been in tears um, with, of joy <laughs> when they receive this recognition because they're working in an environment that is typically very negative or deficit based. Um, so this is a pleasant surprise. And then typically it also triggers some reflection. Um, and you can see people thinking, ah, this was good the way I did this. Um, so I'm going to do more of it. People change their behaviors. Um, we showed that with that quality improvement study. And I know just from personal experience, when I receive one of these reports, it, it's, it influences how I go about my business in the future. Very good. I'm sure we can relate. Um, here is a question. Uh, first, thank you for this original, interesting and motivational talk. Is the focus on negative events anchored in culture, Esper Small, is the question. Yes, I think so. I think it's partly evolutionary, partly cultural. I mean, certainly our education, if you think about what you learn in school, it's, it tends to be about correcting errors, finding the right way by eliminating the wrong way. Um, and that's certainly true for my education. I'm, I'm fairly confident that's still very prevalent in education. And then also, I think the, the nature of our work in healthcare is about diagnosing problems. Um, we fix the patients by finding the problem, the, the issue that they have, and then trying to cure it or eliminate symptoms. So it is the negative based. It is a deficit base. Um, so I think, yeah, culture, evolution, and education 
I'd be interested in other suggestions, but it's certainly a well-recognized bias that we have. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we can uh, all agree that it's almost instinctively the, the urge to, to point mm -hmm. out uh, errors. Last question to you, Adrian. Um, are there cultures with a positive focus? On a more practical note, how do you teach leaders to give positive feedback? Yeah, I think that I think there are cultures in healthcare and other organizations that are naturally more positive. And I I think it a lot does come from leadership actually. I recently handed over a leadership role and was quite surprised at the influence one has as a leader through the, through one's behavior it gets amplified um so i think the best way of influencing people in leadership positions to give positive feedback um is to model it so uh to to deliver the feedback yourself it's qu it's quite unusual for positive feedback to go up the chain of the hierarchy so we, we see it in learning from excellence, but I think we could do more of it. And I even wonder if our leaders outside healthcare, like our politicians, um, our leaders of big industry, would be uh, would do a better job if they actually received more recognition rather than more criticism. Um, we maybe should be expressing gratitude just in generally up everywhere, but uh, particularly up the chain. Um, that doesn't mean that people stop being accountable. It just means that they get feedback and recognize when they're doing something right and they can do more of it. So I think that to answer the question, I think the, the way to encourage our leaders to provide more positive feedback is to show them some positive feedback in balance. It has to be sincere and you have to mean it. Uh, but then that would set the, um, that will model their own behavior. Thank you so much, Adrian Plunkett, for your uh, insightful and uh, very motivational uh, take on uh, giving uh, positive feedback through uh, learning from excellence.